I want to believe that we are not a lot of passive people. So I'm here to talk today about changing the way we give. Because I've come to realize in the last several years that if we're really going to change the way we eat, then we really need to change the way we give. And that means all of us. So I'm going to start off with a little about me. I'm one of eight daughters. I have seven sisters, yes, no brothers. There was a lot that I learned from that family. And I was laughing earlier, we learned a lot about sharing. And we shared everything except for our boyfriends. <laughs> my introduction to the food system started here with my mom. My mom's name is Peaches. My father's name is Herb. How could I do anything? <laughs> yeah. True story. My mom was a great cook, and she put a lot of love and a lot of heart into that food. Now, a family that size, you're going to guess, has a fairly large dining room table. <laughs> yeah, I was at the kids' table that time. But we had, it was an amazing experience. I loved to sit around that dining room table, and it was not optional. Dinner, you had to be there if we were having it. And what I learned is how to share food. I learned about good food, because my mom was a great cook. I learned about people. And around that table was an ever-changing cast of characters with an emphasis on the characters. There were actors and filmmakers, innovators, crazy people, travelers, and all of them were welcome. My mom always said, there's always room for one more. So I grew up in LA in the 1960s. It was a time of great creativity and hope. But it was also a time for civil rights marches, the Vietnam War, famine around the world, drugs, and rock and roll. So let's fast forward a few decades. And today, for my day job, I get to sit around tables like this, tables like this, with people who were just like those people sitting around my kid dining room table, people who had big ideas, who had big dreams, people now who take big risks, and who love life and want to see a better world. So I work in the, the realm of food systems philanthropy. And I'm guessing that by this time of the day is that food systems, you kind of got a sense of what that is. But if I asked you to define philanthropy, could you do it? I struggled, and I've been working in philanthropy for 11 years. So it comes from the Greek. Philo, which means love, and anthropy, which is human. It's the love for humanity, the love for humankind. And sometimes people, when they think of philanthropy, they think of it as a charitable donation or a charitable institution. But that's only sometimes. Because philanthropy can be a very simple act, like buying a box of Girl Scout cookies. It's the time right now. Or volunteering at your kid's school, or sharing a meal with somebody in need. Only sometimes is it about the money. And that can be a penny drive. It can be a handful of dollar bills. And I don't know about you, but money wasn't one of those things that I was always very comfortable about talking about. As a kid, it was off the table. That was one of those big things that wasn't on around our dining room table in terms of discussing. It was a private matter. We didn't talk about it. So I got really curious, because money seemed really mysterious. And I was wondering, what is the big deal about money? Do you remember the first time you saw a $100 bill? I do. I was about seven or eight, and it was sitting on my dad's dresser. So while he was in brushing his teeth, I snuck a look, and I grabbed it, and I held it, and I thought we were really rich, really rich. And I still get a charge every time I see a $100 bill, just like these folks. But one thing I've learned about money over the years is that it's a tool. It's a very powerful tool, but it is not the tool. It is not the only tool. In our work in food systems, shovels are equally important. For those in school food or other kinds of people who are working with the food, sharp knives are really important. So all of these tools are going to be needed and need to be used much more of in order to get the food system that we want. So like I said, I work in food systems philanthropy. And the people behind the money, we call them funders. They're just regular people. They're just like you. They're just like me. There's funders among us. They like to learn. Yeah, and everybody wants to know who those funders are, I know. <laughs> but they're just regular people. They want their life and their work to have meaning. They have questions. They want to engage. They want to find out how the food system works. And they want to create community. And they want to have fun. 
So as Winona said, I work for the Sustainable Agriculture and Food Systems Funders, and my diction has gotten much better since having to say that for the last 11 years. It's a really hard name, a harder acronym, but the purpose of the organization is very simple. It's to network funders for a vibrant, healthy food system. The history goes like this. Started with a handful of people sitting around a table in 1991, handful of funders, and they were all supporting sustainable ag and food systems change. Stayed small for many, many years and very obscure, even more obscure than it is today. But then in the early 2000s, remember when suddenly everything food and ag, the interest in all those issues started to skyrocket? Well, the same interest has been mirrored in the philanthropic community as well. So in 2003, we had 10 members. Today we've got 85 and it's still growing. So what do we do? We connect them to each other. Primarily we work funder to funder and we connect them so that they know that they're not operating in a vacuum, so that they can learn from each other. We educate them so that they understand those issues. Dr. Bernard, so that they understand what it is to live in a good food, barren land. We want a lot more money to go into it. And whether it's humane animal production, or school food, or getting access to healthy, fresh food in urban or rural settings, or maybe it's creating buffer zones on farmland, or maybe it's protecting heritage seeds. All of those issues and more are really important. So why should you care or why should you even know about SAFSF? Because if you're working in the food system, there's a whole network and potential allies and partners that you might not know about. Who are they? They're individual donors, they're investors, they're community foundations, they're private, family, corporate foundations, they're grassroots giving circles, they're faith-based organizations, and they're government agencies at all levels. Where are they? They're everywhere. Like I said, there's some here. They're in your community for sure. They're in my community. They're working at the local, the tribal, the state, the national, the international level. They're working all over. How many? I don't know. Like I said, we have 85 members, but my guess is that we have thousands in the US alone and many, many more around the world. Okay, so how much are we talking about in terms of money? That's what everybody wants to know. How much? How much is going into this work? Again, we don't know. The research that we did is seven years old. And in 2007, was looking at a period of three years, it was $128 million. You know, that's not chump change. That's a lot of money. But my guess is that if we were to do the same survey today, it would be hundreds of millions of dollars more. And that's the good news. But there's more to give. Because I want to introduce you to some people who are not only giving with their money, but they're changing the way they give. I love this picture. These are folks in North Wilkesboro, North Carolina, where the Duke Endowment is working with Crossfire. Crossfire is an intentional biker church. What started off as a, a dying community mountain church has been reinvigorated to be this incredible worship community. And where they worship is the cooler of a former transfer station of a chicken company. They farm together. They've started a nonprofit called The Giving Table. And they are rebuilding the local food economy. In Navajo Nation, I don't know how many of you know, but very recently, January 30th, they passed a historic 2% tax on junk food. Yes, yes. They are the only place to do it. They passed a historic, historic tax, and they eliminated a 5% tax on fresh local food. How they do it, the community gave to itself. The people like these folks who, who raised their voices and went to council meetings, people who put in their communications expertise, and with three small grants totaling less than $25,000 from First Nations Development Institute, that's how they did it. They gave to, to themselves. In LA, they call it fruit anthropy, not philanthropy. Food Forward is a food gleaning organization that started with one guy picking fruit off his neighbor's trees because he got sick and tired of it rotting and falling to the ground. So fast forward, he enlisted his friends, his families, random strangers, random volunteers, and five years and almost two million pounds of fruit later, he's changing the way they are changing the way Southern Californians are able to eat fresh product. That's grassroots and treetops in this instance. In Denver, there's a fabulous cafe, and the next time you go to Denver, please go. It's called The Same Cafe. Its name is also its mission, So All May Eat. And it operates on the principle that you can meet a basic need, like providing good food, to anyone who walks through the door with dignity and respect. 
you pay if you can. If you can't pay, you don't, you volunteer an hour. The founders, Libby and Brad Berkey, invested their life savings, which wasn't much many years ago, but didn't quite reach for a commercial kitchen. So they were operating with hot pots and electric skillet. And then Libby gave a mile-high TEDx talk in 2011, and all that changed because her talk was heard by Bill Wallace of Restaurant Facilities Management Association. And RFMA has a giving program where once a year they work with an organization that needs a commercial kitchen, so suddenly the same cafe was taken over by electricians and masonry and masonry guys and plumbers and all kinds of everyday people showing their love for humanity and creating this fabulous commercial kitchen so all may eat. These kids are the future, like all the kids that we've seen today. One of them is my daughter, and they're an inspiration to me. Over the last several years, they've raised almost $10,000 coloring name badges at conferences. So what started off as a way for us parents to keep our kids occupied while we were trying to go to conferences, yeah, <laughs> turned into a bunch of kids learning how to hustle, <laughs> learning how, most importantly, really how to talk about money and how to put it to good use because they've had to do the due diligence. What groups do we want to support? And some of those grants that they have made have doubled the project budgets of the organizations that they gave to. And they feel, yeah, yeah. So like I said, I, I hope that we're not passive people. I love that song. But I think we all need to speak up. There's multiple ways that we can give. We need to use our big outdoor voices. You need to speak up for what you believe in. We need to connect. If you haven't met the person that's sitting next to you or the person behind you, I would really encourage you to do so because the community that we want starts right here or starts wherever you are from where you're watching. Ask and listen. We need to all ask the questions that we have. None of them are dumb questions. But then the real gift comes in the listening to the answers that we get. Give money. Yes, give money and get dirty. And stand in possibility. Because if we are really going to make the change in the food system that we want to have, we have to believe that it's possible. So I want to say thank you to the people, all of you, and all of the people who gave to make these conversations today possible. It's an honor to be part of this conversation. Peace and blessings.